Hello, I'm your host Jim McLean. Welcome back to another episode of the Bandaflix Movie Review Show here on NVTV. Let's see what movies we'll be talking about tonight. We'll be reviewing No Hard Feelings, which was released in cinemas this week. And our DVD of the week is Charlie Chaplin's The Kid, which has been re-released by Criterion. So that's what I've lined up for you in this week's show. And joining me in the studio this evening is a local writer, Hamish Calvert. Hi, Jim. Hamish, good to have you on the show this week. It is, once again, sadly, another warm studio this evening. It's sweaty in here, viewers, I, I assure you. But I know we're going to be talking about a few films this week specifically, Hamish, and you are, you are a critic as well. But uh, you have been busy on Twitter. You're one of the few people I know that are still active on that medium. Elon Musk salutes you. But it is Pride Month, and you have been busy showcasing a lot of different films that are relevant with uh, the LGBTQ plus community. Yeah, so it's become a little bit of a tradition of mine. Uh, three years ago, I started a thread where I recommended a queer film for every day of Pride Month. I think it's just, it's a good chance to recommend these films that often don't get the attention that they rightly deserve, whether that's on their release in the cinema. A lot of them don't even make it to cinemas and you have to go elsewhere streaming to find them. So I think it's just a really good time to highlight these films. So this is the third year now I've been doing it. Um, and it, like you say, it's a range of uh, genres and I've done some documentaries, some uh, narrative features, some short films this year as well, because there's so many great queer shorts. Um, we've talked about the likes of ones that have come out this year, like Joyland, Close, um, and then some other streaming titles. I know you spoke about this recently on the show, Knock at the Cabin. I think that's a really good example of a film that people maybe wouldn't consider to be a queer film, but it has a queer family at its core. And I think that's what the queer community would like to see more of these films, these big mainstream films that feature queer characters played by queer actors and that deal with queer themes. So the likes of that and another recommendation is one of my favourites that I've mentioned this year is definitely going to be hard on Disney+. Plus. Um, it was initially going to be taken off Disney+, Plus when they announced that call of all their content, but uh, the queer community and fans of the film really spoke up and said, look, this is a brilliant film. You shouldn't be taking this off, especially coming into Pride Month. It, it looks at the Howard Ashman's career, who was um, a lyricist for Disney. He wrote a lot of the lyrics for the likes of The Little Mermaid, which obviously has just had the tree make released in the cinema. But it's a really good uh, documentary that shows his contributions, but also delves into his personal life. And that's something Disney haven't been great at in terms of uh, focusing on their queer characters, their queer talent and their queer staff as it would be. So that's a really good one. If you've got Disney Plus, I would recommend putting that on and you'll see a whole new side to The Little Mermaid and those who made it. Yeah, and uh, talking about if we still have Twitter, you know, we can find on your th we'll have the details there for people to find that because I have been keeping up that it is some great choices you do. But look, that's I wanted to mention that before we get into the show, but I think with that, we shall move on and chat about some movie news. You're so hot. Excuse me? No, I mean like you're smoking. No, I didn't mean it like that. Are you done yet? Yes, please. I'm waiting to talk to your boss. So make like a stream and flow somewhere else. Actually, Gail won't be in today. She's a huge airball fan and the windbreakers are finally in the playoffs. Toot toot. Oh. Okay, well, I just came by because I left my passes for the game here last night. Passes? Like plural? So that's a look at Elemental. It's going to be out in cinemas next month. We're not going to be have a chance to review it this week, Hamish. But uh, it has been released in the States along with The Flash, which I know we haven't really reviewed on the show, but uh, they have not found an audience at the box office in the States. And I know some of the other films have been released in other territories. 
But I know Pixar have been quite adamant that they are blaming, you've already mentioned Disney Plus earlier on, the fact that a few Pixar films have went straight to that over the pandemic and they believe now that, that families seem to be waiting for these Pixar movies to come onto that service as opposed to going to the cinema. But then you think of the success of Super Mario Brothers recently, does that counter that? Of course, we haven't seen Elemental, so we don't know. We can't share our thoughts on the film. We've already mentioned this as well, Flash as well. There was a whole other stuff going on there, but just your thoughts on why do you think we're seeing these big films now not finding the audience because I know this is not the first DC movie this year and into last year that has not found the box office success we'd expect from these type of films. Haven't done the numbers, I suppose, a better way of putting it. But do you have any thoughts on why? Well, I think in terms of The Flash um, and DC, with obviously James Gunn has taken over and he's going to reboot the whole universe, there's a few films left sort of on the slate that was already existing, but they just sort of feel a bit aimless now there may be some crossover it's not been made completely clear how much of a cut it's going to be with certain actors possibly going to be returning and um, but they seem quite sketchy on those details so it feels direction as these sort of last few releases that doesn't feel like they're attached to anything and um, there's been so many delays and reshoots with them and i think people are just tired now it's superhero fatigue it has well and truly set in dc always sort of struggled with it i think but theirs was more to do with the quality of their films now with the likes of the mcu which I've, I've sort of come back a wee bit with guardians which was very good but i think because people are now tired of even mcu which was the leaders of of the superhero genre it just has sort of marred the whole genre now and people just aren't as excited for them as they used to be yeah i would agree i mean i've i've seen the flash you've seen the flash you know we're not going to be reviewing it specifically this way i think it's a perfectly fine feature the cgi is pretty shonky at times and that's putting it lightly <sighs> coming back you've talked about the comic book movie fatigue i think already let's park spider-verse for just for now but i think a lot of people are now already tired of the concept of the multiverse it seems to be this is seems to be the thing that everyone wants to do to allow them to do all these different projects like right now as we speak you've mentioned that dc is being retooled we're going to have a, a batman that's part of this new dc cinematic universe but we're also going to have our pat in his own little elsewhere where i think it just kind of gets complicated, muddled, it suits, I've said this before, it suits the comic book pages. I don't necessarily think it suits cinema, but yeah, I, I don't know. There's only so much, you, I can, only so many superhero films I can take, but we mentioned at the start, we mentioned Elemental. I love Pixar. I genuinely adore Pixar. I will make an effort to go see it on the big screen. But do you think it has been underwhelmed or, I don't know if that's the right word, but do you think it's been affected by the fact that, yes, we were under pandemic, that's changed. You know, we had, was it Turning Red? We had uh, Luca and we had Soul all straight onto the streaming platform. Do you think people are now saying, well, we're just going to wait. We don't need to pay. Because for a, a family with, you know, maybe two children, mum and dad, 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 mum and mum, who are going to the film, that could be the cuts of maybe 50, 60 quid here. People are saying, well, we'll go see Super Mario Brothers, but we'll wait for that. Do you think that's starting to kind of set in for families and even cinema goers right now? Yeah, definitely. I think as well, you can see what Disney have faith in. They've got faith in their these Pixar films that have already got things nostalgia attached to them that's why Lightyear made it to the cinemas because of Buzz Lightyear because of Toy Story so it's very obvious what they have confidence in and I think that's just backfired on them because they think that people won't go and see these films in the cinema and they've sort of been proved right by Elemental in America and I, th but I think that's their own doing they've sort of conditioned audiences to think that oh it's probably only worth going to see if it's Toy Story 5, 6, 7 whatever they'll end up at or if it's a sequel or if it's a prequel to something so I think audiences are trained now if there's a new movie that they're going to wait and they're going to watch it on Disney Plus because why bother going to the cinema when as well the window between it being in the cinema and on streaming has got so much smaller so whereas previously you'd be talking sort of maybe half the year to wait 
sometimes it's only a month, maybe not even. So I think that is the issue um, with this, with Super Mario Brothers. Obviously, that's an existing game and that's got stuff attached to it. It appeals to both adults and kids. So I think that's why that's had the success it has. Um, so yeah, I think Disney have backed themselves into a corner with their release schedule across sort of the last three or four years. And I think they've only got themselves to blame. I'm intrigued by Elemental because it looks like very much like it's holding a candle to Inside Out, some of the more experimental Pixar films that we've seen. I already mentioned Soul, which I, I loved, and I was, was gutted that I couldn't see it in the cinema. But at that time, you know, it's scary to think. We keep forgetting that we, we've lived through a pandemic, that elements are still there. But I have the opportunity to watch it. I think it's a fantastic film. I'd love to have seen it on the big screen. Elemental, I will make the choice to go see it in the big screen. But it's, it's, it's a shame. So, I mean, I know we're going to move on, but are you... You like you must be a Pixar fan, so you must be looking for. You will be definitely. You're not going to be waiting to see that on Disney Plus. You're going to be seeing that on the big screen. Yeah, I am indeed. I think as well, it's important to support your cinemas as well, and I think this um, really affects that too. And with the release window getting smaller and smaller between the cinema and streaming, it's only going to harm the cinema. So I think any chance you have to see something on the big screen, I think you should take it. And I'll be going to see this in the cinema. Yeah. So Hamish and I, we're going to be there. Hopefully, you will be too, viewers. But look, with that. Let's move on and let's review something that is in the cinema. You can't know about this. Percy! Natalie! This is your babysitter, right? <laughs> no. I'm gonna teach you how to have a good time. Okay. Maddie, you can't outrun the cops! I can't lose my license! What? So that's a look at No Hard Feelings out in cinemas now. Jennifer Lawrence, she's playing a 32-year-old woman. She's an Uber driver. She's lost her car. Well, her car's been taken away. What good's an Uber driver without her car? She sees an ad on Craigslist where mother and father are looking for a woman to date their 19-year-old son before he heads to university. And comedy ensues. Or does it, Hamish? I don't know. Were you a fan of this film? Yeah, I was. I think what I enjoyed most about it was seeing Jennifer Lawrence just let loose a bit. She's naturally funny and it's great to see the film take advantage of that. She's previously done a lot of franchise films, The Hunger Games and um, other things, the X-Men movies. And I think that just got a bit samey for her. Then she met into the more serious dramas, the likes of Mother and Red Sparrow. So it's nice to see her having a bit of fun. And I think when she's having fun, it's obvious and that made it easy for me to have fun and it'll make uh, it enjoyable for the viewers. I don't think it's quite the all-out comedy that the trailers have presented it as, so I think people could end up being disappointed if they're going in and expecting a laugh a minute. It's not quite like the American Pie movies or Bridesmaids, something like that, which it's sort of been billed as. It's more of a comedy drama, I think, but I think that's good because it's not try hard, it's not trying to get a laugh a minute because I think it knows it's not going to be able to do that. So instead, it's a nice blend of humour and heart and I thought the chemistry that the two of them have is really good. Um, so I think it depends how you go into it. If you're going in expecting an all-out comedy, you will be disappointed. But if you go in just sort of expecting a comedy drama, a nice mix of the two with a great performance from Jennifer Lawrence, you should be pleased. Well, Hamish, I'm glad that you enjoyed the film. I genuinely am delighted that you had a good time watching the film. And I'm also delighted you didn't use the term dramedy because I hate that phrase. Producers, no, we're not having it here in the Band of Flicks show. But I was really disappointed by this, genuinely disappointed. Now, regular viewers to the show will know I am probably not, I'm not the target audience. I'm tone deaf to what the trailer was selling anyway. The trailer was selling me as this being a kind of, not one of these kind of, not gross out comedies, but that kind of genre. And it's from the director of Bad Teacher, who, who also did Good Boys. I have a bit of a soft spot for Good Boys, although I do have a, a soft spot for little Jacob Tremblay, because I think he's a great little actor. I love Jennifer Lawrence. I can't disagree with what you're saying. I could go off and say, oh, it's, it's not funny enough, or it's, try, it's these type of run-of-the-mill American comedies that's trying to have its little moments of crudeness. There's a bit of gratuitous nudity in this film that is completely unneeded. And you mentioned Red Sparrow, and I was kind of thinking about that film, because I know Jennifer Lawrence has talked about this, because she, she used, there's a, a scene of, we see a lot of Jennifer in that film, 
and she talked about that being uh, a reaction to photos being leaked online and she was taking back control and taking back control of the of um of her own body i suppose the better way i can think of it in this heat in this studio but that was an interesting point that she made with that film i don't see the point in it here at all the worst thing i can say about a film isn't that i hated it the best thing i suppose is that i love it but the worst thing i can say is i was bored and genuinely i find myself i think it runs at about an hour and 40 minutes maybe close to two hours i'm not sure i sat in a cinema screening a pretty full cinema screening and there was a few chuckles there is some funny moments like everything if you've seen the trailer you've seen a lot of the film's comedy moments but you come back to when you get an actress like jennifer lawrence it's great to see her back anyway on the cinema because don't look up was released on netflix didn't get a theatrical release i can't remember a time really where she's done comedy per se i think she does because you come when she's been interviewed you see she comes across that way i think given the right material i there's something there for her but when you get an actress of her caliber there's a sequence that i find actually quite moving if i can say that i've just dissed the film for the last five five so minutes there's a sequence where they're out on a date and her young partner is playing the piano and she does nothing it's just her reacting. And it's like, that's what you get when you put a great actress like this with really mediocre narrative or mediocre screenplay. That's what you get. You get when you get her just to say, just show me everything, but tell me nothing. You go, that's fab. I just, I don't know. I think the fact you mentioned something and I just want to come back to that. I think it's how this film has been sold. And we talk about how marketing men and women will sell their soul to get you to buy a cinema ticket. I think they're trying to sell this as something that it's not really. I mean, it's not really a, a, a gross out comedy. It's not a bad teacher type of film. I think that's what this film, if you looked at the trailer, that's what you think you're being sold. So you've mentioned that, so I'm going to push you on that further. Do you think it's going to work against this film? Yeah, definitely, because I was the same as you when I saw it in the cinema, there was hardly any laughter. And I think what I found with it was those uh, bigger sort of tentpole scenes that are designed to make everyone laugh and be hilarious weren't particularly funny. What I found funny were little throwaway lines that they probably didn't think twice about, but it was Jennifer Lawrence's delivery of those lines. And I think the point you say about that scene in the restaurant, that was the turning point for me because I think it was slow to start. Um, and when it got to that stage, it won me over because I was like, okay, this isn't what I was sold. This is something else which is going to be uh, multifaceted. There's going to be more to this than just gross out comedy. So I think it depends how long, how much patience you have because that sequence is maybe half an hour, maybe longer into the film. So I think if you're going in expecting something hilarious, you will be disappointed because there isn't really anything. Like I wasn't laughing out loud a lot. I was, it did enough to amuse me and I did think it was funny. It was that combination of the humor and the heart that won me over. If it didn't have that other section, I wouldn't have, thought, I would have thought it was good. And that's what I thought I was being sold. Um, so yeah, I do think that is going to work against it. I think this would have maybe done, I, ironically would have done better on streaming after all our discussion this is maybe something that you stumble upon and you think oh, okay that's a bit of a hidden gem but with the trailers and promotion for it i think people will go in expecting a very different film only in cinemas that's what the marketing has definitely branded with this film i do want to i know we'll have to move on because we only have the half hour but i want to ask one thing it crossed my mind when I was watching the film. This film was made, if it was made in the, the 80s, maybe the late 90s, I think it would have been told from the boys' point of view. And I think of stuff like Weird Science. And we look at those films now. I know I do specifically and go cringe. And you go, mm, I, I like those films when I was younger. Now I can see the problems. If, if Dr. Juliana Monteverdi was here, I could hear her going, this is the problems, Jim. And it's like, yes, I agree with you. There has been talk about unease about what this film is showing with an older woman, with a younger boy. I don't want to get dragged down into that, but do you think it's an interesting choice in how they've decided to frame this story from Jennifer Lawrence's character point of view? Because I come back to that point. I think if this film was made 
in the height of the kind of the 80s, 90s, it would be typical boy's dream kind of thing. I think it would be told from a different point of view. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think I read a comment from someone saying, you couldn't have made this movie gender swap. This is one example where that wouldn't have worked. And it's interesting because even parts of the film, they sort of uh, criticize cancel, cancel culture and um, that you can see, see the, the age difference, even though Jennifer Lawrence's character is only 32, she's a generation older than these uh, up, up and coming college kids. So I think it's, it's aware of the sort of, uh, the critiques that it could be brought its way. Um, and I think that sort of saying that they didn't really care. And I think because they've swapped that, and I think, I think it's the self-awareness of it that lets them get away with it. But there are parts of it at the start, certainly, I was thinking, mm, not sure about this. But I think generally as it goes on and how it develops and what happens, I think in the context of the narrative, it works. Yeah, okay. Well, look, mixed feelings towards the film, I think. With that, we shall move away from the big screen and let's have a look at our DVD of the week. That's a look at the kid. No, not the Bruce Willis film. Some of you I know will be bitterly disappointed. This is Charlie Chaplin's 1921 directorial debut as a fe uh, for a feature. Going back, uh, this has been re-released by Criterion with their new remaster. And uh, it was out in cinemas a couple of years ago to celebrate the film's 100th anniversary. I think it's 102 years old now. So I was just saying, kind of, while we were watching the clip, you, you'd never seen this film before. And I think, is this your first dabble with Charlie Chaplin? Yeah, it is. So I'd always seen clips from his films before, but I'd never ever sat down and watched one of his films from start to finish. Um, and it was really pleasant surprise. I wasn't, well, I wasn't surprised that I enjoyed it, but um, it was just a nice experience to actually properly watch one of his films. Um, I loved the, the mix of humour and heart. And I think what I enjoyed most about it was the performance of the kid. I think he's just brilliant. He has such comic timing for being such a young actor. Um, I think my favourite bit was when he's throwing stones through the windows to smash them so that Charlie Chaplin's character can come and earn some money repairing them. And the policeman sort of catches him and the, his comic timing in that scene alone and then his little runs back and forth, they're just brilliant. But equally, he was great in the dramatic moments as well. And obviously this is a silent film, but that doesn't matter. You get the sense of emotion, the sense of despair that's going on in these scenes. So I was really impressed overall just at how much it was able to convey, even though it was a silent black and white film. That doesn't mean that something can't do what it intends to do. Yeah, I agree. I mean, I am a fan of this film. I mean, I do prefer later stuff by Chaplin. I mean, I adore The Great Dictator. If you have not seen that film, I would definitely seek it out. I know the the speech by the aforementioned dictator in that film feels more relevant now in 2023 than it did back in the 1940s, scarily. But um, this is just a film that proves for me the timeless quality of silent cinema and those silent movie stars like Chaplin, Buster Keaton, I think, I mean, I adore Buster Keaton. He was a, a stuntman by really, if you look by today's standards. Like you've mentioned, it's, it's the performances. I mean, we know Chaplin's tramp. We, we've we've come. That's the iconic role, and we should it, should it, I suppose, throw out some you know a bit of kind of idea of what the narrative is all about. If you haven't seen the film, the tramp, Chaplin's famous tramp, is finds himself in the care of a young child who's left by a woman who we're not quite sure whether it's her husband, boyfriend, doesn't want to doesn't want to be there, doesn't want the child. He's left. She's left in a car, I think. I believe. And then Chaplin's Trump raises this young child. And like you've mentioned, just so many scenes, there's, we think of the fight sequence in this, is, is kind of entered into kind of pop culture in its own right. But like you, the sequences with their various schemes to make money, where the, the child would throw stones at the window, Chaplin's Trump would then fix the window. And then it is a 300. We then have, I think she's just known as the lady or the actress who at the start of the film leaves a child, but then becomes a successful movie star in her own right. We'll not spoil everything, but 
do you, having not seen the film before, and you've, you've clearly been taken, quite taken by it, but would you agree with me? There's that timeless quality in the sense that there's a universality to, to silent cinema in the sense you can show it anywhere in the world. And you can see the influence on Chaplin's work and even stuff like, throw in like the Minions, because the Minions don't really talk, they talk gibberish. Let's be honest. I mean, I do love the minions, but that sense, that physicality you get, that's why I think it will work to audiences today. There's, a, there's always going to be a timeless quality to slapstick comedy. It's what I maybe wanted more of in No Hard Feelings. Throw in a bit of kind of Chaplin esque slapstick comedy, and I would be in my element in that film. But would you agree with me in that sense that viewers now in 2023 can sit back and enjoy that film? Yes, there's elements have dated, but there's that. I keep saying the word apologies, that timeless quality to these films in the sense that they're not narrative heavy. You can sit down of all ages and watch them. Yeah, definitely. I think that's why it works so well. It's just simple, but so effective. And I love as well, the production design is very clever and it just enhances all that. It's the likes of when the man's swinging and he misses Charlie Chapman, hits the lamppost and it keels over. Like it's just, it's simple, but silly and it just works and I think as well the shorter runtime helps as well obviously we're used to slightly longer run times now um, and I think this is just over an hour and I think that's perfect because if you drag things out that are that simple too much it, they lose their impact but I think it knows when to go for the laugh and it knows then when to pull on the heartstrings and I think knowing that balance is just it's what, what you need to make good cinema and it's clear that that's what uh, Charlie Chaplin did and having seen this now I'm, I'm dying to get into all the rest of his films if they're anything like this. Yeah I mean I would definitely recommend The Likes of the Great Dictator there's a few others as well that are that are of equal standard coming back to what you mentioned I mean that the kind of physicality the use of slapstick and the use of heart to pull on your on the heartstrings I mean there's a sequence early on where it's just pure slapstick I think the tramps just walking through the street and we see things falling and it seems kind of that kind of Chaplin-esque walk but later in the, the end of the film near the end of the film when it starts to move towards tragedy we start to see him using the same techniques but you become yourself that sense of you're, you're being emotionally manipulated and that's a, he's using the same thing that's meant to make you laugh but it's there to make you cry and I think that's it's a very clever ahead of its time film when we think of films from that time they're very much clear this is the genre that they're in we see Chaplin kind of blurring those lines and you see it again in other films he's done but look I think we've we've at least finished the show on a positive note watch the kid seek it out in DVD if you so can um, Talk to yourselves whether you want to watch No Hard Feelings or not. Hamish loves it. But look, that's this week. I think before we wrap up and say our goodbyes, Hamish, let's have a look at the movies we'll be talking about next week. All right, everyone, OK? Kids, you good? Why did you come back for them? Do you know her? Tyler? Pulses indicate. What? Oh, the beeps and blips? We don't know. Some of our information about outer space may no longer be completely accurate. Anyway, there's still only nine planets in the solar system as far as we know, Billy. Except now there's an alien. What's happening now? I don't know. I don't like the way that guy looked at us. The alien. How did he, how did he look? Like we're doomed. Maybe we are. I've just informed the president. How long can they keep us in Asteroid City legally? The world will never be the same. So that's a look at Asteroid City and Extraction 2, which we'll be talking about on next week's show, the last in the current series. So, you know, Hamish, wipe that tear away. <laughs> you know, we will be back, I assure you. Any of those two films piquing your interest? Hamish, I think you've seen Asteroid City. Yeah, I've seen both of them, actually. Um, and I won't go into too much detail about either, but uh, I would recommend both. So there we go. You'll have to wait to see next week what we think of the film on the show. But all that's left for me to do now this evening is thank you very much, Hamish. Cheers, Jim. And thanks very much for watching at home. We'll be back next week with the last show in the series. But for now, until then, goodbye.